Welcome to the Young Turks. I'm your host, Cenk Uger. For those of you watching live, we love you guys. Thanks for your patience. Uh, I was on the Rachel Maddow show tonight at 9 o'clock Eastern, and that's what delayed this show. Uh, we talked about Anthony Weiner. I've got very strong opinions on that, as you might suspect. Coming up in a little bit, but we're not going to start with that story. Uh, also, there's a conservative talk show host that has said something so over the top, not just racist, but incredibly violent. We're going to get to that story. Uh, and there's a lot of great stories out there, but I'll tell you, we're going to start the show with two stories that I think are the two most important stories of today, and not one that a lot of shows are covering. And it, honestly, it, it's going to tell you a lot more about what's happened in this country and what is happening in this country than any, anything else. And they're the kind of stories that, that I'm proud that we do this show to, to be able to tell you. Okay, now, without further ado, let's do the first one. New York Times is reporting that a guy named Glenn Carl, who is a former CIA officer and at one of the top counterterrorism officials during the Bush administration, uh, is talking now for the first time about an investigation that the CIA launched on Professor Juan Cole of the University of Michigan. Uh, we've had Professor Cole on the show many times because he is one of the top experts in the Middle East in the country. Well, it turns out uh, the Bush White House asked for an investigation of him for reasons that I will explain in a second. First, uh, how did this go down? Well, Carl was asked by a supervisor, uh, Mr. Lowe, uh, to go and look into uh, Professor Cole. He first quote from Mr. Lowe, according to Glenn Carl, quote, what do you think we might know about him or could find out that could discredit him? Fascinating. Again, I will tell you why in a second they are looking to discredit him. Um, and then Lowe continued to ask, but what might we know about him? Does he drink? What are his views? Is he married? So obviously they don't, they're not interested in this guy in terms of, you know, is he a suspect in anything? No. He's just, as you'll see in a second, a guy who disagrees with the administration. And they're not looking into his ties with Al-Qaeda or anything like that. They're looking into, is he married? Does he drink? What kind of lifestyle does he have? And by the way, of course, there's no charges of Professor Cole doing anything wrong whatsoever. And by the way, the CIA is not supposed to be investigating American citizens. I mean, if you wanted to look into someone and you thought there was anything slightly wrong, you'd go to the FBI, not the CIA. This is horribly illegal. And so to Glenn Carl's credit, he says, I'm not going to do that. What do you, that's crazy. I, that, you can't ask me to do that. And by the way, if you're wondering about uh, Carl's uh, motivation, he has never said this story before, and the New York Times clarifies, and it's James Risen, one of the most respected reporters. Uh, he's the one that broke the warrantless wiretapping story. Uh, he's the one that broke the story about how we were not really chasing after uh, Osama bin Laden except for 36 guys in Tora Bora. Okay, so some of the major stories over, over the last 10 years, right? So James Risen says, he did not come to us. We had heard about this story from someone else, and we went to go confirm it with him, and he did confirm it. He's out of office now. Uh, so when Carl asked Lowe, hey, why are you doing this? Here was the answer, quote, the White House wants to get him. The White House wants to get him. This is, I mean, this is Nixonian. This is outrageous. And they're going after him because he does not agree with their position, as you're about to see. So uh, then uh, Mr. Carl said to the New York Times, quote, I couldn't believe this was happening. People were accepting it like you had to be part of the team. So the idea was what was previously legal and illegal, who cares? We're way past that, okay? Now you just got to be part of the team and we just investigate people in the United States, even though the CIA should not be doing that under any circumstances. Now, that was the initial investigation, and by the way, uh, after Carl refused to do it, Lowe apparently did it anyway, there was a file, and then they asked Carl to deliver it to the White House. And he opened up the file, and he said that there were questionable things in it uh, about his personal life, not questionable as in what Professor Cole was doing, but questionable as to why in the world they would investigate that. And uh, he said that there were, quote, inappropriate and derogatory remarks in the file, he brought it to the person above Lowe, and that person said, oh, no, we, this is crazy. And he uh, crossed out with red ink the things that were about his personal life, etc. So at least Carl's actions led to some protection of Professor Cole's uh, private life. 
again, the fact that the CIA is doing this, and his boss acknowledges it. His boss, not Mr. Lowe. Uh, Lowe, of course, says, oh, me? Oh, I had nothing to do with it. I'll give you his quote in a second. But uh, the person above him says, yes, Carl did come to me with that request, and yes, I remember looking at a file, okay? Uh, now, after that, there was another investigation, apparently, and this time it was by an analyst who was assigned for, uh, from the executive assistant of the spy agency's deputy director of intelligence, John Kringen, very senior person at the CIA, comes to Carl again and says about Juan Cole, quote, have you read his stuff? He's really hostile to the administration. Well, oh, great, then why don't we go after him then? I mean, this is going on with a straight face. The only guy who seems to be objecting is Carl, and so he can't believe they're doing this again. <laughs> Professor Juan Cole had a funny uh, quote about this when the New York Times asked him about it. He said, they must have been dismayed at what a boring life I led, <laughs> because they got nothing on him, okay? But what he was most concerned about was that, that they were doing this to other people. He said, you know, what el who else did they do this to? What did they find, and how, what did they release, and how did they release it? And why is the CIA looking at American citizens? Now, as to the motivations, right? Well, uh, there we have some interesting things. When they asked Lowe, hey, uh, why did you do this or did you do this? He says, uh, I have no recollection of that, and I certainly would not have been a party to something like that. Ugh, that is a huge legalese red flag, non-denial denial. I have no recollection of that. When somebody says that, eight out of ten times, nine out of ten times, that means they did it and they're like, well, if you have the records, I, I'm not going to lie about it but I just say, I have no recollection of, oh, you found the records? Well, I didn't remember it. He continued by saying, I remember the name as somebody I had never heard of and who wrote on terrorism, prefer, referring to Professor Cole. I don't recall anything specific of how it came up or why. In other words, yes, I definitely looked into him, so if you catch my name on any memo, I'll say, oh, see, I told you I kind of remembered him, but I didn't remember why we were looking into him. Not obvious, obvious lie. And you could tell from the words. Uh, now, when you go to ask John Negroponte, who was the director of national intelligence, the top guy, did you guys look into Juan Cole? Here's what he tells the New York Times. He did not recall the incident, here we go again, he did not recall the incident, but that the White House might have asked others in his office about Professor Cole. That's it. They definitely did it. Okay, because Negroponte doesn't want to lie, right? So he's saying the White House might have asked about it, but I don't recall, me, I wasn't involved. It was probably other people. <sighs> so, and why did they do this? Well, the CIA's lame excuse, uh, as they continue to deny the story overall is, well, you know, we had invited him to some panels on uh, terrorism and counterterrorism, and so we wanted to look into his background. Wait a minute, you had already invited him, so that doesn't make any sense, right? So what was actually happening? Well, right at that exact same time, end of 05, in the 06, Professor Cole was up for a professorship at Yale. And the neocons did not like that because he was opposed to the war. And they wanted to make sure he did not get that position. And at that same exact time, there were editorials and uh, writings and blogs and pundits on television all speaking out on what a bad per person Juan Cole is. They did, said that he was anti-American and anti-Israeli. And their whole effort was, we don't want this guy to get a great uh, professorship at Yale and have even more legitimacy. By the way, he's a professor at Michigan, which is fantastic. So, too bad, all you've done is make him more legitimate. But you know what happened? Of course, Yale didn't give it to him, because there was a lot of pressure. So, is it possible that somebody at the White House, a neocon at the White House, asked the CIA for Juan Cole's records so that they can go out and smear him on television and in the press? Well, it's not just possible. You see the article. It's almost certainly what happened. And whatever their reason was, if you want to put that aside as to why they did it, the fact that they did it is nearly indisputable and grossly illegal, horribly illegal. Will there be any consequence to this, any actions? None. This is likely the last time you'll ever hear this story. You think the Obama administration and Eric Holder at the Justice Department are going to go back to see if the CIA broke the law by investigating Americans? Oh, come on, don't be silly. They don't look backward, they look forward. You know what happens in, in, in the past? Crimes. Why would a prosecutor look at that? No, he looks forward to, you know, put his feet up and do nothing. 
about the horrible abuses of our civil liberties that happened under the Bush administration. Somebody should definitely be arrested over this. And by the way, how do we know that they stopped doing it? How do we know how many people they did it to? How do we know what they did leak when they found something on someone else? I mean, at the very least, there should be an enormous investigation of this. But don't hold your breath. All right, so that is monumental story number one. All right, I'm going to go on to monumental story number two, which I think, so that's what happened in the past, right? Uh, but I want to talk to you about what is part and parcel of our system now, as I fix my earpiece there. Um, so there's a story about uh, for-profit colleges and what the Obama administration has done with them, and it is incredibly instructive. Okay, so let's find out how Washington works. Well, uh, in the beginning, uh, what they had proposed, the administration and Department of Education, was uh, pretty strict rules on the for-profit colleges because it looked like there were a lot of scams that were being run. Uh, a lot of kids would not really get a, a good quality education. They couldn't get a job afterwards, and they had these tremendous debts. And the reason that these for-profit colleges are even in business is because they're taking government money, right, to say that they're giving an education that sometimes they don't give at all, and they're certainly not helping the kids to get jobs. So hey, it was great news that the Obama administration was taking that seriously and looking into it. Now, on previous days, we've told you that some of their top donors are from for-profit colleges. In fact, they just put out a press release, almost a press release, a leak that was coordinated saying, hey, we are looking out for the donors from for-profit colleges. They almost brag about it. Well, great investigative story on Huffington Post. Uh, Robert Sherman is a former deputy undersecretary of education. When they asked him about, hey, it looks like the new rules now are totally watered down, here's what he said, quote, it is absolutely accurate to say that they caved to the industry. But I understand the political dynamics of being in an admi administration and needing to take a step forward in the face of a hostile Congress. The right thing for this issue is for it to survive. So that is a startling admission, where he just says, yeah, we caved into industry, the lobbyists were too tough, and we caved into them, uh, but hey, look, it, at least it survived. I mean, that is exactly the Obama mindset. Now, Huffington Post explains, and let me quote them here, the general thing of what happened here. They say, quote, the industry's lobbying was so well financed and well coordinated that it altered the view of what was possible inside the Obama administration. The focus shifted from seeking to craft the strongest rule to instead making do with incremental progress and avoiding the sort of action that would trigger con congressional intervention aimed at protecting the industry. Okay, so that is a perfect description of what happens inside the Obama administration. Sometimes they come out strong and then the lobbyists come in and go, oh, you better not do it, and I've got the guys in Congress that are bought, you better water down your bill, and they do water it down. Now you're saying, all right, look, that's the Huffington Post summarizing and you got an insider from the administration, but is that all you have? No, this is definitive. Now, next person is a current administration official, and he says, uh, with, you know, he says it anonymously so he doesn't get fired. Quote, there was an atmosphere that if the opponents in Congress felt that the wind was at their backs, it would not be too difficult for them to take action. In some ways, there is a decision to make. How do you provide a good level of protection for students and ensure that you put a good regulation out there that's not going to get overturned in one congressional cycle. You see what they think every single time. Ah, we could do something strong, but then somebody might water it down, or somebody might kill it, or it might not pass. So let's preemptively water it down ourselves. We keep the lobbyists happy, we keep our donors happy, and then we don't get Congress yelling at us. This is a terrible mindset. But it's not just that. Look at this. Now, Arne Duncan. The Secretary of Education says this, quote, The new rules are both thoughtful and reasonable. They reflect a great input from the industry. He just admits it, right? And they are designed to give career colleges every opportunity to reform without letting them off the hook. The feedback was extraordinarily helpful. We took it very seriously. And hopefully many folks will see their comments, were listened to, and acted upon. He's telling the press, we took the lobbyists so seriously, and I'm telling you, and we changed the legislation based on what the lobbyists told us to do, and I hope that they are satisfied with how much they've gotten us to change the legislation. Oh, this is embarrassing. This is how our system works. But you see both sides of it. 
the Obama administration's profound weakness, and yes, Congress is bought. And, and it is a reality, they got to deal with Congress, and Congress uh, often will overturn what they did. In fact, there are examples of that. Represent, in this case, Representative John Klein, Republican of Minnesota, introduced a budget amendment that aimed to block the Department of Education from releasing the gainful employment regulation, which was part of the, the tough reforms that they were going to do. And who was he backed up by? Well, uh, House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi and Democratic National Committee Chairwoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Why? Well, the for-profit colleges donate a tremendous amount of money overall, but specifically to the Democrats. Now, the Republicans are always on board. You run some sort of scam where you get money from the government, they love it. They pretend to be free market, but if you're ripping off the government, the Republicans are your best friend. Even if you don't give them that much money, they just ideologically love the idea of the government getting ripped off. You think I'm exaggerating. Here's Jim DeMint, the guy who's the head of the Tea Party, the guy who says, oh my God, free market this, free market that. He introduced an amendment to an economic development bill that would nullify the gainful employment rule, which was the toughest part of that provision. Now remember, these are people sucking off the government and then not really delivering an education, okay? And Jim DeMint wants to protect them. And so these guys are smart. They give a third of their money to the Republicans, and they figure, we got them in the bag anyway. They'll do anything a private corporation tells them to do. And then we give two-thirds of the money to the Democrats, we buy them. And so if President Obama actually wanted to do something, which he, at the beginning, did want to do something right, uh, then we'll scare him with Congress, and he'll back down. And that's exactly what happened. All right. Uh, by the way, one more quote for you. Um, if we go back to Sherman now, the former Department of Education official, he says, quote, they still probably made the political calculation they needed to make, referring to the administration. This is so weak, referring to the bill as it stands now, this is so weak that if Congress overturns it while continuing to play lip service to the need to protect taxpayers and students, it would be a complete and total outrage. Again, right there in a nutshell. He's saying, don't worry, the Obama administration made the bill so pathetically weak that it would be kind of embarrassing if people voted against it at this point, right? And besides which, it doesn't really do anything. By the way, so what were the things they were going to do? They were going to say, hey, listen, you need to prove that these kids are actually getting jobs. That was the gainful employment part that DeMint hated and, and the Democrats and the Republicans tried to kill in the House, right? So that, what happened to that? Gone. Gone. Now, what do they have to do? they have to inform the students that they might be incurring a lot of debt. <laughs> That's a big deal. They're going to write in this you know, tiny little uh, print, oh, by the way, as you sign up for this college, you might incur a lot of debt. And they say, before this kid signs up for the college, there's got to be a three-day waiting period. Ooh, a three-day waiting period. And then some of the jokers in the article from the administration come out, and they're like, well, that'll make them think twice. We really got them. So in the end, what happened? There was the pretense of doing something. There was a lot of talk about how the Obama administration got tough on these for-profit colleges and the scams that they're running. But in the end, they actually did nothing. The, weak, the bill was so weak, it accomplished nothing that anyone could object to. So did the kids going to those colleges win? Absolutely not. Did the taxpayer win? Oh, we're getting ripped off, huge. No, we lost. Who won? The lobbyists, the for-profit colleges, the Democrats and the Republicans, and the Obama White House, because they got to hang a mission accomplished banner as they do every time. This is how the game is played in Washington. It's a disaster. It's gamed totally on the money. Everything is dependent on the money and the lobbyists. We're just pawns. So I look, some say, oh, but that's depressing. Don't tell people. <laughs> what, what, what am I gonna do? Lie to you? Okay? And you look it up for yourself. If you doubt me in any way, just look. I mean, it is direct quotes from the administration, from people that were in the administration before, people that are in the junior levels, people that are at the senior levels, people saying it in public. You can't doubt it. That's what they do. And so when people wonder why I object to the Obama administration, that's why I object. Because they're not really, do they, he came in on change. You remember that? He came in on change. <laughs> they were going to change the system. Does that sound like he changed the system? That sounds like he's playing within that system as the most cynical politician you can imagine. Now, look, 
then people will turn around and say, what do you want, a Republican? No, you know what? A Republican wouldn't even do the bill. They wouldn't pretend, right? And they would come up with excuses why we should funnel more taxpayer money to those for-profit colleges, right? I get it. So we're stuck, and we're going to have to go in this direction, right? But we have to have a long-term fight. We have to. If we don't do campaign finance reform, how many times have I told you and how many times have I showed you with evidence? We will lose on every issue. There is only one issue. It's campaign finance reform. Until we get the lobbyists to stop paying our politicians, there, we have no hope. All right, one last thing along those lines, uh, small little story here, but again, it's very informative as to how the process works. Mike Pence, very conservative congressman from Indiana, uh, is con considering running for governor. And so uh, what do they do for him? Uh, the Republicans get together what they call the, quote, Saturday Evening Club in New York, where they go to a very fancy restaurant, and, uh, and they say that they are bringing together 25 to 30 leading journalists for an off-the-record roundtable discussion over dinner with a significant public figure, and that they do this from time to time. It is put together by the American Spectator, a conservative magazine financed by David Koch. Okay? So uh, Mike Pence comes. There's a couple of journalists, John Fun from Wall Street, it's a couple of guys from American Spectator, the typical, you know, right wing, uh, you know, depending on your perspective, hacks journalist, right? Okay, that's fine. There's no, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> They're fi a fifth of the people that showed up. 80% of the people that showed up were lobbyists and funders. Okay? So this is how the game is played. First of all, he sits on the one side on his left is the head of the American Spectator for Pence. On the right-hand side, you know who's sitting next to him? David Koch. He says, M Mike, this is how we're going to do this. Okay? Who else is there? Well, uh, you know who Pence brought? He brought his fundraiser, Lisa Spies, and she's also the director of his political action committee, his chief counsel, Josh uh, Pitcock, and GOP pollster, Kellyanne Conway. Now, if you're just talking to journalists, what is your fundraiser doing there? What's your director of campaign doing there? What are they doing there? Right? They say this is not a fundraiser at all, because technically, uh, because of the laws in Indiana, Mike Pence cannot be raising funds now. So he is not raising funds at that dinner. The funds will come in later. Okay? Uh, well, uh, who else is there? Grover Norquist, uh, President for Americans for Tax Reform. Uh, Alfred Regnery, publisher of the American Spectator and uh, Regnery Books. They're the ones that put out all the conservative books, the Ann Coulter books, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, that's another scam. They funnel these politicians' money by giving them an advance on their very important book. In other words, you play ball, we give you X number of dollars, whether it's a couple hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars, based on how big a, a politician you are and how many favors you've done for us. And then if the book makes money, great. If it doesn't, who cares? That wasn't our purpose anyway. Our purpose was to buy you. All right, other people. Wall Street uh, guru Steve Grasso, director of institutional investing at Stuart Frankel. Private wealth manager George Russell. Uh, Thomas Lerman, the co-founder of the Gerson Lerman Group and a former George W. Bush administration appointee. I'm just giving you a tip of the iceberg, and the list goes on and on. But to give you a sense of who these people are, what has Lerman done in the past? He has personally donated more than $238,000 to various GOP candidates and committees. Who else was there? Two Pfizer lobbyists. Those are the drug companies. Everybody who wants to buy a congressman and a governor, we're at the table. Oh, you're running for governor, Mike Pence. Don't you worry about a thing. You're going to have plenty of money. Uh, oh, welcome to our meeting with journalists. But we got your back, man. You get our back, we get your back. One, that is how politics is played in Washington now. That's it. Number two, that is the entire Republican Party. That is part and parcel of what they do. Mike Pence doesn't have a thought in his head. And he couldn't give a damn. Ideology. Principles. What does Pfizer need me to do? What is Mr. Koch telling me to do? What is Grover Norquist telling me to do? What is Mr. Learman telling me to do? Then that's what I'm going to do because that's what I get paid for. Mike Pence, that's the Republican Party, and that's our system. All right. When we come back, we will have fun. We will do a little wiener. Alright, back on the Young Turks. See, I, I told you we were going to start having fun. Alright, 
Couple of things. Uh, on Thursdays, since I'm not doing Fridays anymore for the Young Turks, because I'm, I'm getting sick again, mm -hmm. I gotta have some sort of sanity in my life, right? But on Thursday, I feel like I want to squeeze in all the stories, all the stories, and I'm like, oh no, I didn't get to those. Oh my God, Rob man, I forget it was great. All right, and that drives Anna crazy. Just want to let you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. One, one, one quick thing. One quick thing. Another uh, part of one of the stories I didn't get to, which I love. You know that back in 2005. Uh, the Republicans, it was all Republican controlled at that point. Bush, uh, it, House, Senate, all Republican controlled. Uh, they did a big deficit reduction plan, okay? And God, it was hard to pass and they struggled with it, et cetera, et cetera, even though they controlled everything. And they got a huge deficit reduction. Now remember, we're talking now about either $1 trillion, $2 trillion, or $4 trillion. Anna, you want to guess how much deficit reduction they did? Zero. <laughs> that would have been a good guess, but they actually did something. They did something. Uh -huh. uh, Hundred billion dollars. That's a significant amount of money, though. Bullshit. Look, when the, the Republicans and, and Joe Biden started talking, on the second day they, they got to a trillion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Republicans, when they do deficit cutting, they're like, ah, oh, oh, hundred billion, okay, oh, are we not awesome, right? When Democrats are in charge, they're like, you better give us four trillion. On the second day, Biden's like, here's a trillion. And he's going to two trillion, no question. By the way, you know how I was telling you, they started at two. Then yesterday, I saw an article that said two point four trillion. Now that uh, Republicans are asking for today, I saw an article Republicans asking for two point five trillion. Ay ay ay. Okay, back when they were in charge, what five percent of that? Less than five percent of that, and they were bragging about. You know what though? My expectations for the Republicans are so low that a hundred you said a hundred billion, yeah. right? A hundred billion sounds like a lot of money. Like I'm <laughs> expecting like a hundred thousand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the Republicans are such failures when it comes to, to deficit, a deficit reduction. Yeah, yeah, it's true. They're like, uh, we did not take the private jet once. Hundred thousand. Are we not merciful? That's it. We move along. God, all right, I'm gonna beat that to death next week. Okay, we move on. All right. Uh, I have a story for for this hour that has to do with Anthony Weiner. If you guys aren't wienered out yet. <laughs> okay, here there. comes more wiener. <laughs> we have more wiener for you. No, but this one is an interesting story uh, that involves Larry Flint. Mm -hmm. Larry Flint is actually offering Anthony Weiner a job. Good for him. At Flint Management LLC. Which is right down the street, actually. It is. It's in Beverly Hills. It looks uh, great. And he basically, by the way, this isn't done for publicity. It's a serious job offer. And he's basically telling Anthony Weiner, look, you are a person who has fought for progressive causes. You know, you are the type of person who, as J.R. would say, has a fire under your ass. And you would <laughs> do well in our company. So I would really like to hire you. And he is offering, uh, this is what the letter says, uh, I'm willing to pay 20% more than your former 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 congressional salary, ensuring that your medical benefits would be equal to what you were previously receiving, uh, and also he would have to relocate, and Larry Flint said, I'm going to pay for that as well. Right, and remember, Flint's very political, right? And he has attacked Republicans in the past for their hypocrisy on family values, and he has unearthed some of their scandals, mm -hmm. right? I love Flint, right? And he is actually one of the biggest freedom of speech fighters uh, that we have in America, okay? And he got shot for it, among other things, right? So, and he, there was a very important case involving Larry Flint, et cetera. There was a movie made about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I love Larry Flint. So, I, you know, 19 out of 20 times, I would say this is a publicity stunt. In the case of Larry Flint, yeah, I'm sure he doesn't mind the publicity. Right. But, but he's earnest. I mean, he would love to have Wiener work for him. Wiener's not going to do it, of course. That would be embarrassing, hustler and all that stuff. But, but it's, you know, I like that he's making the offer anyway. What do you think the likelihood is that Anthony Weiner, at some point, um, comes back into the political It's Very high. Yeah. You know why? Because a year from now, people are going to look back and go, Jesus, why'd that guy resign? Th they're going to be like, wait, wait, did he break any laws? They're going to have this conversation. Like, what did, wait a minute, what did he actually do? So he sent out the stupid pictures, but like, did he break any, like, what happened, right? What was the actual substance of that scandal? Mm -hmm. And they're going to go, oh, nothing. Well, yeah, he should definitely come back in. It's, uh, over 40% of New Yorkers want Elliot Spitzer to come back into politics. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, okay, of course, because uh, you look back at Elliot Spitzer and you say, what happened? He slept with hookers. Who gives a shit? I know, but wasn't Elliot Spitzer also the one that was prosecuting prostitutes? I know, yeah, I so, know. I mean, I, he was the prosecutor, there's... yes. There was no question of hypocrisy, and he left office, right? Right. 
And I didn't defend him like I defended Wiener in that sense. But they targeted Spitzer. There's no question about it. Okay, no, I didn't that know dude that. was set up. I mean, he slept with the hookers, but they dove in to find it. Okay, I, I think it'd be a variation on your predic prediction. One year, not nearly long enough. First of all, I think you need five years, and things need to be, which looks like they will be, exponentially worse. Sp specifically in New York, which they will be. So like that has to happen, and it has to be longer than a year. They'll yeah. still they'll still remember the penis pictures in a year. No, I hear you. I hear you. Okay, fine. Am I not merciful? Three years. Okay? And here's what's going to happen. Uh, Elliot Spitzer, Anthony Weiner, and Alan Grayson are going to get on some horses. And they're going to ride into town. And that day is going to be awesome. Okay? You forgot your boy Feingold, man. I know. Feingold's out too, but, you know, Feingold might be coming in earlier. Now there's talk that uh, they are going to try to, well, they, we know where they're going to try to recall Walker when he's up, the governor of Wisconsin. Now there's talk that Feingold might uh, oppose him, uh, mm -hmm. might run for governor against him, which would be awesome. But Feingold is actually doing great work. He's raising a lot of money uh, for campaign finance reform. So I'd almost rather have him fighting that fight than being governor or senator anywhere. Uh, one last thing on Larry Flint. I ran into him at a restaurant, mm -hmm. and I went up and told him, you're an American hero. What did he say? <laughs> He's got some speech issues. I was like, what? Come again? <laughs> and then there was a woman there who basically translated. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I got the, th like, at first, she was like, who the hell is this guy, right? And, like, coming at me and saying, you're an American hero, right? <laughs> it's like, all right, dude, all right. And then when he figured out what was going on, he's like, oh, I appreciate it. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, Good. yeah, of course. He has a golden wheelchair. Is it really made of pure gold? Pure gold. That's amazing. It is. I'm a little I jelly. Don't. <laughs> don't be jelly. That is not something to be jelly. No, 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 no. no. But <laughs> I'd, <laughs> I'd, I'd <laughs> like <laughs> something <laughs> made of pure gold. Like, I would love an office chair made of pure gold. Oh, get the hell out of <laughs> here. All right, come on. <laughs> By the way, the only person here who has an office chair close to being pure gold is J.R. Jackson. He's got the executive chair. He's styling and high profiling. <laughs> JR, did you bring that in or did you make us buy that? No, you guys, you bought that. You, yeah. you bought that. I bought that? <laughs> when JR Jackson comes around trying to unionize, <laughs> you tell him, piss off. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I said it. Piss off. <laughs> I, I didn't know that. Look at that. Mr. Fancy. Hey, nobody likes arms on their chairs here in this office except for me. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Spare me. Okay. Hey, hey, Jesus, our union bus. What happened? I, why don't you have a fancy chair? <laughs> well, uh, I reduced my paycheck from our business and I let him get a chair. Uh, so look at that. That's what a good a nice union guy. boss. Yeah. That's how you do it. Okay. That's how you show leadership. All right. Uh, what's up? I, I did get a new mouse. <laughs> oh, you did get a new mouse? Oh, we're very fancy around here. Very, very fancy. You fancy, huh? Oh, you fancy, huh? <laughs> okay. All right. Forward. Babies in Nigeria are being sold to witchcraft. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Okay, this is an extremely depressing story, but I think that it deserves a little attention. Um, an organization busted a ba uh, baby trafficking ring. Basically, 32 girls between the ages of 15 to 17 were put in this room. They were imprisoned in this room, and they were forced to have their babies two term, and after they gave birth to those babies, uh, they were either sold to adoption or sold to witches to practice witchcraft. The babies would be, for, when, when they are sold to witchcraft, they're sacrificed for good luck charms. Well, obviously. Uh, all right, so this is apparently, and this is amazing, the third most common crime in Nigeria. Right. The second most common crime is uh, drug trafficking. The most common crime, and you won't be surprised if you know anything about these email scams, is economic fraud. Okay, the Nigerians, for whatever reason, are the ones that invented economic fraud. Now, of course, it's been economic fraud a long time, but they do the Nigerian scams with, oh, my dear beloved, right. I happen to have a gazillion dollars. <laughs> and if you just send me your $38,000, well, have I got a deal for you, right? <laughs> and they've been running that for decades. That's the number one crime in Nigeria. That's almost tough to be the number one crime. But on the other hand, in America, what's the number one crime? Economic fraud, mm -hmm. but, but by Wall Street. Anyway. So, to me, I, I look at this thing, man, I think, geez and Lord mercy, you couldn't find another crime? Like referring to the witchcraft selling of the babies, etc. How do you live with yourself? How like, do you live with I mean, yourself knowing, well, they get paid a, 
a huge amount of money, especially, you know, considering Nigeria. They get paid $6,400 for each baby, right? And then they give the mother a cut of that, and by a cut of that, I mean $170, if she's lucky. If she's lucky. Right. You know, after they hold her against her will, and they trick her, and it's right. all, all that, and at the end, they're like, okay, here's $170. Run along now, right? Now, look, I, there's got to be some bounds of reason. I cannot believe people are that evil, right? I mean, going to drug trafficking. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You, you want to make a ton of money doing something incredibly evil? At least that's better than trafficking babies. They kill the babies for witchcraft. Now, some of them are up for adoption, so they're not all killed, etc. And I know it's a cultural thing, and the witchcraft is, uh, come on. Yeah, you know how you talk about how you don't need to, you don't believe in respecting all cultures this is a perfect culture that we don't need to respect okay at all you don't kill babies for good luck charms what kind of monster thinks it's a good luck charm to kill a baby <sighs> man there is some serious look i don't believe in evil as a concept but there you know <laughs> if you believe in evil there's some serious evil in this world and for to me the way that i look at it is people who are acting selfishly for their own benefit, this is at the top of the list. You cannot be any more selfish for your benefit. What you know you who mean? would love this? Ayn Rand. Mm. She'd be like, oh my God, what a superman, willing to murder babies what for a, money. What a great business idea. Right. What a great individual. She doesn't care about the community. She doesn't care about others. She's just looking to get paid. And then Paul Ryan and then Rand Paul would come along and go, oh, legendary Ayn Rand. That's from another show. Check that out on YouTube. And on a related note, uh, birth rates in the United States have dropped for the third year in a row. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, th we experienced a record high of births in 2007 with 4.3 million babies born. How amazing is that? That's a massive amount of babies. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of babies born in the world and in America. Yes, I'm not that 4. amazing. 4.3 million babies in 2007 alone. But then in 2008, it dropped to 4 million, and it's been um, steadily decreasing since, mm -hmm. which, which I think is a good thing because, you know, our population is... A little high. A little high. <laughs> it's a fascinating theory. No, no, no. I, it I, is. Don't, look, I don't care look. about how high it is at all. Like, people always get concerned no. about that. I mean, you should be concerned about it because there are limited resources. And when there are limited yeah. resources and your population is growing, I mean, obviously that's going to be problematic at some point. I'm not going to go all China and tell you, like, hey, you can only have one baby, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's definitely something that you should be concerned about. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. I hear you. First of all, be responsible. Don't have 13 kids when you can't afford it. Everybody gets that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but. Uh, now I'm going to unleash a swarm of lib emails against me. All the stuff about like, we're running out of everything, oh my god, limited resources, we're going to rip each other's eyeballs out. Not I'm buying it. Oh, uh, god, I'm going to get so many emails. Mean? What do you mean? Sometimes, Jake, you say, that. what do you mean we don't have limited resources? Of course we have limited resources. Infinite resources. Our population you know continues to grow. Oh, here's my idea. What's your idea, Jake? God creates more. <laughs> yeah, okay, now I know you're foolish. <laughs> no, 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 no. Seriously? Look, this is uh, Malth what they call Malthusian, right? If I'm pronouncing that kind of questionably, but anyway. Uh, uh, Malthus came up with the idea of, oh my God, humans are growing at an exponential rate. We only have limited resources. We're going to run out by like 1873, right? And it turns out we didn't. Why? Because we have human ingenuity and we came up with new ways. And, and that's why... Uh, when the guy died, I feel so bad that I forget his name, but Balrog, whatever, the, <laughs> the guy who invented a different way of doing crops so that it multiplied the amount of food we had in the world by a gigantic amount. And yeah. I did a whole ode to him when he died. But anyway, so that stuff happens. Now, look, I know, I know. We're getting to near, some people are worried that we're getting near the end of our ingenuity, right? And some of that ingenuity ain't going to help us because the pesticides are actually hurting us, right. yada, yada, yada. We might be running out of soil. We might be running out of oil. I get all that. I think we can get beyond that if we have the right system. Mm -hmm. Okay. The problem is we've set up a selfish system that is set up on short-term gain. And that's what the real problem is. Right. So since we're set up for short-term gain, we are going to start running out. The, whoever is at the top is sucking all those resources out and not thinking about the long term. So don't get me wrong. We have massive problems ahead for us. But if we fixed it, I think we could get beyond those problems. The problem is the wrong system.
Well, the good thing is that we have this quality, affordable education that everyone has access to. Yeah, right. So, you know, so they go to school that. and they learn how they can overcome these problems in the future and everything's going to be okay. Okay, well then problem solved. <laughs> okay, one last thing on the population. There are two reasons why it's going down. Uh, economy is bad and people are thinking can we really afford another kid makes right. sense right there was another there was another reason for it that I found a little questionable okay they're saying that um, th we're seeing less and this is only with the United States okay this is a study on the United States and the population of the United States um, researchers are claiming that we're seeing less immigration from Mexico mm -hmm. and since less women from Mexico are immigrating to the United States then we're seeing a decrease in the amount of babies born because Mexicans have higher birth rates but it, really, really? Actually, yes. No, I know they have higher birth rates, right? But it, it's a huge change. It's not like I mean, f from four million to four. I mean, sorry, four point three million to four million. That's three hundred thousand babies. You've less. done the math correct. <laughs> okay, Nicely done. Up. First but, time ever. So really, well, because of I mean, of course, the economy has something to do with it. But even to say that it's not a mass scale. That's it why. is. It's yeah. Okay. So three things actually: economy. And the economy is bad, so you have less immigration. That inhibits our growth. Right. And then the third thing is less Latinos who do have higher birth rates. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's a well-documented uh, fact that uh, Jesus Godoy uh, is the oldest Mexican not to have a baby. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, what are you, 30 or 31 now? I'll be 31 this year. Wow, that's going to like shatter uh, all records. I am sh the shame of my family. Shame of your family, of yeah. course. Yeah. Not a, not, like he doesn't have seven kids. He doesn't have one kid. I don't know what's going on. All right, anyway. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. All right, anyway. Uh, let's take a quick break here and come right back.